Coming up on this week in computer hardware, GTX 2070 and 2080 are new NVIDIA GPUs coming in April. APUs are back. We got benchmarks and review of AMD's Ryzen 5 2400G and Ryzen 3 2200G, NZXT's lovely 8700i tempered glass case, and yes, a water-cooled power supply, and it's only $700. All that and more coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 453, recorded February 15th, 2018. Are new NVIDIA GPUs coming in April? This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by the Ring Video Doorbell. Stop crime before it happens and help make your neighborhood safer with Ring. Go to ring.com slash twitch and get up to $150 off a Ring of Security kit. And by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Home plays a big role in your life. That's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. It lets you apply simply and understand the entire mortgage process fully so you can be confident that you're getting the right mortgage for you. Get started at rocketmortgage.com slash twitch. Welcome to Twitch, This Week in Computer Hardware, Twitch weekly show that aims to bring you the most useful, most engaging, most delightful, and occasionally even most affordable advice in PC and mobile hardware. Joining me as always, well... Joining me most of the time, Mr. Ryan Trout. <laughs> How are you, sir? Uh, I'm good. It's like uh, almost 70 degrees here today. It's like upper 60s. Uh, astonishingly warm for the middle of February. And like, well, yeah. and because yeah. we don't have the air conditioning on, it's actually warm inside the office, uncomfortably so. So, you know, hey. You I doing? just recorded a podcast. I just recorded AVXL with Robert Heron in the front seat of my truck. And... Uh, I bring that up because I understand it being uncomfortably warm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're having some audio issues because of construction and I ended up uh, in the truck while they were doing jackhammering. And uh, nice. it's uh, it's a little warm, uh, even with <laughs> the uh, even with the thing in the windshield blocking it. I mean, technically, it's only 60 uh -oh. degrees, but it feels more like 65 or 70. And when you turn yep. your truck into an easy bake oven with two people exhaling inside of it, it seems even hotter. <laughs> crazy Weird. hot rumor this is a transition mm -hmm. for you this is a segue um wccf uh tech last week uh almost a week ago now uh nvidia ampere ga104 gpu powering geforce gtx 2080 and geforce gtx 2070 launching in april mass production has begun gp102 aka the thing that powers the 1080 ti is end of life uh, Usman Pizzada, WCCF Tech, uh, and they they flat out label this as a rumor. You know, yep. leak season is starting, and I guess they found it originally from a place called 3D Center, um, which uh, I could barely get to run through Google Translation. Uh, but if I'm not mistaken, Ampere Gerüchtekuka Production would be German. Um, but uh, you know, the the it is officially the beginning of the possibility of the nearness of the next generation NVIDIA GPU, which of course spawned, uh, you know, internet rumors that the real reason you can't buy a GPU is because NVIDIA is basically waiting to force everybody to buy the new GPU, which makes no sense, um, or that they cannot, they're, they're scaling up the new GPUs, but don't want to sell them yet until they have a big stockpile uh, which also doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me because I don't think they'd shut one line down at the production facility uh, before they they launch the next one. In any case, do you do you expect a new microarchitecture succeeding Pascal, uh, the GA one hundred four, uh, on April twelfth? Uh, I don't know. Um, Watch his face the, closely, because if he has NDA face, you'll know it. <laughs> I, don't, I don't. I honestly have none of that here. Um, <clears throat> the the idea that um, NVIDIA would release a, a new generation of product, not call it Volta, it, because Volta has been out for a while now. It kind of makes sense that they would, even if it were a slight deviation on it, want to rebrand it, right? Because Volta is kind of, it's not old, but it's like it's been out in the high-end um, 
you know, machine learning and professional spaces for for several months, um, maybe maybe as much as six months now. So it kind of maybe has lost some of its luster. So it wouldn't surprise me if they were um, rebranding or reconfiguring it. It also makes sense from a certain point of view to move away from the Volta architecture and its tie into HBM2 memory. HBM2 memory is still very expensive, still hard to manufacture and get a hold of. Uh, and if NVIDIA wanted to make a more mass market part, they would maybe tie it to G5X or GDDR6 memory system. And if you do that, naming it something other otherwise would be uh, a, a useful thing to do. I think there's enough data points out there now that April seems like a reasonable time frame. It's right after, so GDC is like the second or third week. Uh, is, is the third week of March, and then NVIDIA's own GTC, GPU Technology Conference, is the last week of March. So they could use either one of those opportunities to announce the product and then have a mid to late April, whatever, relaunch for it with reviews and going on sale and all that type of stuff. So it wouldn't surprise me if that's the case. There was another story I snuck into the show notes as well that kind of countered this rumor, not that they weren't going to uh, release a new product in that time frame, but that the naming might be confused. And this story on Tech Power Up claims that NVIDIA Turing is actually a chip hand built or, or customized for cryptocurrency and blockchain mining in order to free up the Volta architecture to be used for gaming, which is an interesting conversation to have, right? Also, if you kind of think of the name Turing, it kind of makes sense, right? Um, because it was, it was a British scientist, Alan Turing, credited for leading a team of mathematicians that broke the Nazi enigma cryptography. So right. crypto mining, blockchain, computer accelerator kind of makes sense for that that nomenclature. Not that they wouldn't be able to use it for gaming and get away with it. Um, but according to this report, it says it's being designed to be compact, efficient, and ready for large-scale deployment by amateur miners and crypto mining firms alike in a quasi-industrial scale. It's kind of interesting to see these quasi. two rumors pretty much in direct opposition to each other uh, come out within the same week or so. Um, but both both lean into the fact that it doesn't mean something's not happening in the April of this year timeframe for a new product release. It's just a matter of, is it going to be Volta or is it going to be something else? Or is this something else built to, to counter the, uh, the mining side of things? I don't really know. I, I'd be very curious and I'm interested to learn about what a mining specific chip looks like that somehow changes the ecosystem if it's cheaper to build and it's easier to manufacture and get out of the market and, and produce in volumes i don't know why gamers wouldn't be interested in that if there's a bulk of it and the same thing occurs if you're miners then once all of those those turing parts go away um then the <laughs> they would just go right back to buying whatever those consumer class cards are. Um, so it doesn't necessarily mean, I don't know, some people I'm reading this are saying this is kind of uh, this Jensen is going to save PC gaming. I guess that's the title of the story, right? And I just don't know if that's really possible in our current ecosystem, the way it works. I, I hope it's the case. Um, it, it suggests a fundamental lack of understanding in the idea of economics that as long as somebody can buy all of the cards and keep making money, they'll buy all of the better cards. And then if the, the money makes sense, they'll buy all of the cards that aren't as good as the awesome cards um, because they are funding a business, not trying to buy onesie twosie cards for gaming. I, I get people want to be saved and they want Jensen to be saving them and they want Nvidia to be the hero in this. And it's great if they can pull it off. But, you know, I think they'll buy all of the super cards that are designed for, you know, just like everybody who can't buy an ASIC is going to buy these cards and they're still going to try to buy ASICs. And then they're all going to keep buying all the consumer cards as long as they can make a profit doing it. I, I think the only thing either, either flood the market with so many cards that everybody who wants one can buy one because then you don't have scarcity or you make it so that nobody can make money mining anywhere with the cards and then there's no economic motivation to buy all the cards. But, you know, scarcity will exist as long as people can make a metrics pile. I can't use that other highly technical <laughs> term on a family friendly podcast. Um, as long as people can continue to make a pile of money they will buy all of the cards. I mean, that's just that's just money. People like making money. Um, yeah, you know, it, it is what it is. 
And a lot of the people that are doing this, people think it's like Bob in his garage and he's got a couple of machines and then he buys the third machines. And the reality is it's like there's people running out industrial spaces and moving to parts of the country with cheap electricity just to create huge industrial spaces full of mining equipment where the electricity is cheap, which makes it more affordable to mine. Um, it's like been a big complaint in certain parts of Washington and stuff that like they're getting flooded with people putting huge strains on the electrical system because they're running huge mining operations because they can make more money. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. It's, it's a, it is not a problem that is going away anytime soon. I think, um, no. it would be awesome. If this card was so super and amazing that it made the problem go away instantly. Uh, but this is me not holding my breath on this one. Yeah. Yeah, I think it, regardless of what actually happens, it's nice to see that there looks like there's some movement from NVIDIA in the side. They've been pretty stagnant in the GPU side because they've had a lead. They've had an advantage in gaming and all these other spaces. Um, they've had no problem selling cards either, just like AMD. So the the desire to push out new architectures was kind of minimized, right? You can do a whole bunch of things if you have more time. You can improve yield. You can improve efficiency. You can improve implementations. Uh, and now it seems like... it. it too many indications are telling us that something's going to happen in April. Some products are going to come out in April. So we'll see if that is a new gaming line, if it's a new mining specific line, or if it's both. We'll see. We wait with bated breath. Snapdragon 845 mobile platform performance review. Uh, this is exciting. <laughs> kind of a good week for phones. Um, Sebastian wrote this one up. Um, so this was actually not an end user phone. It was a reference platform, i.e. Qualcomm sent out these phones stuffed with Snapdragon 845s. It's the newest flagsh flagship, flock ship. Um, <laughs> will the Snapdragon 845 be Qualcomm's Android antidote to Apple's A11? Read on to find out, right, Sebastian? What's uh, you're talking about? Uh, you know, a fairly powerful processor. Um, you know, it's interesting to look though at uh, you know some of the initial Geekbench numbers where it's like. Um, Apple's faster, right? Um, you know, they, yeah. they have a very focused operating system that they tune to a very sophisticated piece of custom silicon. Uh, you know, they, they bought entire companies to advance the engineering and performance of their version of the ARM processor. Um, you know, so when you're looking at this, the Snapdragon 845 reference platform, it's looking at like, you know, 2460, 2461 uh, for a single core, 4233 for the Apple iPhone 8 Plus. Um, you know, there's not quite a 20% lead when you're looking at, uh, the multi-core numbers. Um, yep. you know, the, you know, I will say that, you know, the, it's, it's, uh, if you are for whatever reason, chasing processor performance on your desktop, uh, desktop on your Android phone, um, these new, these new chips, uh, you know, you're looking at maybe a 30% boost over the Snapdragon 835, uh, or the Kirin 960, uh, which, of course, has just been replaced with the Kirin 970, Kirin being Huawei's custom silicon for their flagship phones. Um, it's also mm -hmm. amazing to look at the performance difference between the A10 Fusion and the A11 Bionic on the Apple iPhones. Um, you know, when you're basically looking at a doubling of multi-core performance, near doubling of multi-core performance, about a 25% increase in single-core performance. But again, the point here is that Apple's in the lead because, you know, they can focus. They have a whole bunch of engineering talent and a whole bunch of ability to focus and tune the operating system for the best performance overall. Um, you know, and that pretty much applies for all the benchmarks you're looking at through Geekbench. Um, you know, the uh, it, it's, it's, it, I mean, it's, it's interesting to, to look at this. Um, it's certainly faster than the 835. Um, you know, how that plays out, uh, in the, uh, graphics testing is probably a little more compelling if you're, if you're, you know, wanting the Snapdragon to take names and kick ass because it's, uh, you know, several hundred points faster than the iPhone A, uh, 11 Bionic or the iPhone A plus the A11 Bionic processor in there. Um, mm -hmm. pretty healthy, you know, boost over the Snapdragon 835, uh, and probably doubling the Kirin 960, which, you know graphics performance on that, that is not a particularly compelling uh, uh, part of that uh, processor. Um, I mean, are you excited about the 845? Uh, is processor performance really the most compelling thing about the 845? Um, um, 
So the, the A45 is interesting in a couple of ways. One is some of those secondary features that you can't measure in benchmarks, some of the imaging stuff that they've built into it, some of the AI and, and uh, DSP processing they've built into it. From the performance numbers that, that were in this particular story, what's both what's good about it is that it is 25 to 35% faster than the Snapdragon 835, right? So this is this is not kind of like the 820, 821, 835, where you saw fairly moderate performance increases. 20 to 30% or above is actually pretty pretty substantial. Um, the, what what that means, obviously, is what can that be turned into in these phones? Hopefully, that turns into a better power efficiency as well as better performance. The comparisons to the Apple devices are still uh, mixed, right? On the CPU side, right. the, the the Apple processors are still significantly faster. Um, the A45 cuts that gap, but not enough. On the graphics side, the A45 uh, is proving with its Adreno implementation that it is faster than anything else out there. So for right. VR... Uh, alternate reality, mixed reality, whatever, whoever's going to happen to be calling it and gaming and those types of use cases, this creates a very compelling picture as you look at these devices that are some of those um, um, freestanding headset units, not ones where you slot in a phone, you start to see some of the potential for that as this becomes the fastest SOC for those graphics workloads. Uh, but yeah, in terms of the other things that this that the chip does, right? It has a new modem, it has new DSP, it has new image processors. Um, there's a whole lot of other stuff in there that you can't just benchmark, at least not as efficiently, uh, when you have two and a half hours to do it. Because we they didn't right. actually send these out. We had we went out to San Diego, oh. had a lot of time with the phone in an office, you know, at a in a meeting right. room, right? So you have 32 um, minutes to learn everything you can. <laughs> right, and, exactly. I mean, one of the things was like the Snapdragon 835, the Adreno 630, um, you know, is 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 the performance on that in terms of like OpenGL is pretty fantastic, you know. Uh, although it, it's kind of odd because, right, the, the iPhone 8 runs the Metal API in, instead of OpenGL on iOS. But, uh, um, you know, it's it's... It's interesting to watch this stuff kind of evolve. Do you think there will be performance improvements as it goes from sort of a a, a beta testing situation where you are right now to final products? I mean, because we expect the you know the 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 Samsung you know nine series stuff to get announced at Mobile World Congress, right? The Galaxy S nine. I if I had to guess, I would actually probably say it would go the other way slightly because. You know, Qualcomm is going to use all the all the tweaks, all the improvements, right. all the enhancements they can in their reference design. Samsung may not, HTC may not, LG may not, um, OnePlus may not. Those types of things. So I, I think we'll, you'll be close. You'll be really close to that, if not matching it. But I would hesitate to say that it will get better than the results you see out there. That seems pretty reasonable. Huawei Mate 10 Pro. Uh, did a review that on uh, Shannon. Did a review that on uh, Tech Thing this week. Um, interesting part, right? Because it's it's got that uh, or interesting uh, phone, I should say, um, because it's got the the Kirin 970, which is Huawei's custom, uh, uh, basically Huawei's in-house Samsung or excuse me, Huawei's in-house flagship processor, uh, which they you know competes essentially with the Snapdragon 845 and and Samsung's in-house processor. Um, slightly slower cores, without the Cortex A73, um, but they're running like six gigabytes of RAM. A lot of talk about Huawei's uh, you know AI enhancements, like they put this powerful AI chip uh, in 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 the chipset for the phone, and what it basically comes down to is a custom DSP that you know partially works on machine learning and partially. Um, you know, does like machine learning just kind of figure out what you're going to do next in a given situation and speed things up. And of course, to also, um, you know, do like real time scene and object recognition. It's it's interesting to watch because like AI and machine learning is, is kind of this big buzzword in uh, 2018 in the smartphone market. But uh, probably the most fascinating thing is that it's running uh, two cameras that were co-designed with Leica. Um, a sort of an RGB camera and a monochrome camera, a higher resolution monochrome camera. Uh, and the automatic settings looked kind of atrocious, but going to custom settings, uh, Shannon got some fantastic results out of the camera. Screen looked great, by the way. And uh, unlike certain flagship phones, <coughs> Pixel 2, uh, it doesn't look blue uh, as, as you sort of change angles on it. So it's uh, uh, it was interesting to look at. Uh, full reviews uh, up on techthing.com, but, uh, um, you know, it's. I'm. I'm curious to see whether or not they fix sort of the auto, uh, the the automatic uh, features on the camera because right now the 
auto the automatic settings on the camera are awful. Uh, but the custom settings, if you go into custom settings and manually configure things, it makes some spectacular photos. So that's a, oh, and a 4,000 milliamp hour battery on that, um, which is that's nice. huge. That's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I, I thought that was pretty cool. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, as of yesterday or the day before, uh, U.S. intelligence agencies still are really uptight about Huawei. Uh, you know, the, I think it's like CNBC. <laughs> Like, directors of the CIA, FBI, NSA, uh, and several other intelligence agencies expressed their distrust of the Apple rival Huawei and fellow Chinese telecom company ZTE. Um, and Huawei is one of the biggest, uh, you know, telecom manufacturers in the world at this point. They've done things like offer total access to their source code, which is something that companies like this never do in an attempt to sort of break into the American market. Um, you know, but it's, I don't, I don't think I've ever heard... Uh, you know, kind of the, the director of national intelligence and the people running the CIA, FBI, the NSA, all are basically like, don't, uh, where is it? Uh, the FBI director uh, said, we're deeply concerned about the risks of allowing any company or entity that is beholden to foreign governments that don't share our values to gain positions of power inside our telecommunications networks. So, uh, although some people say that some of Huawei's switches were worked in level three, which is a primary contractor for a lot of pretty serious government agencies, but, uh, it seems to come back to the fact that the 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 founder of Huawei used to uh, work in comms for the Chinese uh, military, so the People's Army. <laughs> um, it, it was I just had to mention it because uh, I don't. I think people are going to email us about it. But uh, man, U.S. intelligence is really against uh, Huawei being used in the United States, uh, and partially I joke it's because they don't want the competition. Um, because they already have all these amazing relationships with uh, U.S. Uh, carriers and ISPs that give them on demand with the appropriate legal paperwork, the ability to get lots and lots of information about you. So I kid, but I don't kid. And uh, I will move on <laughs> to that subject. It's time for our yearly Twit survey. We want to hear from you so we can serve you better. Please take a couple minutes, head over to the twit.tv slash survey and be heard. We're not going to do we're not gathering information to do nefarious things. We basically want to find out what you like, what you don't like, you know, what kind of advertisers should we have. It's our way to connect with you and figure out what works best for our audience and so that we can do what you need and work that in with the advertisers so we can still have a business model and keep making the shows for you. Twit.tv slash survey. If you could take a minute to check that out, Ryan and I would greatly appreciate it, as would the entire Twit team. Indeed. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by the Ring Video Doorbell. Ring's mission to make neighborhoods safer. And the Ring Video Doorbell lets you see and speak to intruders on your smartphone from anywhere. Even share video clips with neighbors using the Ring app. For example, Ryan actually has, he's got a Ring at home, he's got a Ring at work. And one of the things he discovered recently is some of the package delivery people in his neighborhood just fling the package at the door. Which should explain the dented corners and the mashy nature of some of the boxes he gets. Um... Uh, Rings floodlight and spotlight cam. They'll be able to ring a security around your entire property, not just your front door, but the whole place you live in, right? So the floodlight cam, motion activated camera, and floodlight that connects to your phone, just like Rings video doorbell. High visibility floodlights, HD video, two way audio, lets you know the moment anyone steps in your property. And you can shout out if you want to Kid, get off my lawn. See so and speak to visitors, even set off an alarm right from your phone which is fun when you see the deer in the backyard. When things go bump in the night, you'll immediately know what it is because there's lights and HD camera and you can talk. Ring floodlight cams offer the ultimate in home security. Thieves just can't hide with Ring. Monitor every corner of your property with a Ring of Security kit, which includes a Ring video doorbell and your choice of one, two, or three floodlight cams. And you can connect your Ring video doorbell with your favorite smart locks and hubs for added convenience, monitoring, and security. Is that Jimmy at the front door? It is! And you can unlock the door and let Jimmy in. Stop crime before it happens and help make your neighborhood safer with Ring. Save up to $150 on a Ring of Security kit at ring.com slash twitch. That's ring.com slash T-W-I-C-H. And we want to thank Ring for their support of This Week in Computer Hardware. My goodness. Story Botnet just keeps growing. Um, <laughs> the latest flavor of Mirai um, is Satori. Back in December, uh, it infected something like 100,000 routers in 12 hours. Uh, the, oddly enough, one router made by Huawei, the other by Realtek. Um, 
a new version uh, that came out last month. People, the, the crew behind Satori started infecting devices used to mine digital coins. So they uh, mined a whole bunch of Ethereum that way. Um, they're now working over uh, routers manufactured by Dasan Networks of South Korea. Um, so you know, like they've got like nearly 14,000 routers infected. Apparently 82% of them, writes Ars Technica, are in Vietnam. Um, it's pretty crazy. Uh, there's something like 40,000 routers made by Dasan, according to the queries they ran in the Shodan Search Index of Internet-Connected Devices, which is a pretty fascinating thing to take a look at. Um, this is kind of crazy um, because this is, uh, you know, one, apparently Dasan doesn't answer the phone to, to find out that the, the, you know, about the vulnerabilities. Um, and two, um, this is, you know, a way to point Mirai, uh, which did some pretty amazing dial of service techs uh, back in 2016, you know, basically shut down some core components of the internet for extended periods of time. Um, you know, Mirai could only, they would basically guess simple default passwords. Um, Satori's actually hammering on firmware bugs. Um, and if you've ever owned a router, and I bet everyone out there has, you may have noticed that you, you may go years or never have a firmware update to your router. And that's either because the router was perfect from the factory or more than likely that the margin on that router is so thin they could never be bothered to actually repair any of the flaws in it. Um, the upside is that if you reboot your router, um, you know, uh, the infection kind of goes away. Um, but then, of course... Uh, there's just so many vulnerabilities out there that they can just keep hammering on them. So um, nobody's really sure, I think, what this botnet is going to do, but it does seem to be an experiment with somebody trying to figure out how many things they can gain access to. And I, I, have, this, I have this mental vision of them you know, hammering on all sorts of different uh, devices and router and exposed Internet of Things things. And then once they figure out a giant collection of them, then they'll activate them all. And, and start hammering on the internet or particular websites or something like that. But um, something, uh, something worth thinking about as you're looking at that aged router in the corner. Uh, it may be part of something nefarious because it has vulnerabilities that aren't patched. And if it's a few years old, you might want to check to see if there's any firmware updates. And if there has been a firmware update in a couple of years, you might want to think about upgrading that router to something that is upgraded a little more frequently. Uh, speaking of uh, flaws, Intel's expanded the bug bounty program to include Spectre-like side channel attacks with a fantastic $250,000 reward, uh, up to $250,000. Uh, GeekWire's got a nice write-up on this, Tom Krasitz. Uh, security researchers who uncover new side channel vulnerabilities in Intel processors in the wake of the meltdown in Spectre exploits uh, are looking at uh, up to $250,000. Uh, and then... They are also increasing the uh, amount uh, for, uh, I should say, the discovery and confidential reporting of general security vulnerabilities to $100,000. And there's a reason companies are doing this is because there is a market for zero-day flaws and exploits. Uh, it is an active market, uh, a lot of zero-day flaws, i.e. things nobody knows about that you can be the first one to exploit on a particular piece of hardware or software. Um, you know, there are a lot of, of nation states that have agencies that buy these uh, flaws either because they'll be useful for, say, looking inside of a particular model of phone or mm -hmm. looking inside a piece of software or doing damage to someone's whatever, wherever it might be. Um, so for companies like Google and Intel and Microsoft, bug bounty programs offer them a way to get this information for people who may be morally motivated more by getting the most money possible rather than doing the right thing and making the internet safer for us all. So uh, I think it's a smart move on their part. Um, I also was laughing. I had to share this with everybody as we've been talking about the relative unavailability of GPUs. Although Shannon managed to pick up a 1080 last week. I found her a 1080 for $710 at Best Buy. Uh, another acquaintance of mine picked up a 1080 Ti for $900. So if you keep looking, you might get a deal. Have your credit card at the ready. And Best Buy actually seems to be doing some of the better deals out there. Um, the uh, uh, the link is the wrong link, but uh, the AirTop 2 Inferno um, is uh, uh, one of the most insane machines uh, I think I've seen in approximately forever. Um, and there it is. Let me put that link in there. Um, the uh, <laughs> It is a Core i7 7700K GTX 1080 
fanless machine. And just scroll down. Some of the reactions to it uh, involved questioning the aesthetic pleasiness uh, of this thing. But I'm just blown away by the idea that they got a, a, a Core i7-7700K, i.e. an overclockable, unlocked Intel processor, and a GTX 1080 uh, inside this box uh, and actually kept it running. I'm, I'll be curious what the performance is like, having seen some uh, TDP-challenged machines turn in some really atrocious performance numbers recently. Um, but uh, I guess they're going to be working on a Kickstarter campaign on February 24th. And if you go to uh, fit-iot.com slash web slash product slash airtop to build to order, uh, you're going to need three weeks, uh, but you can pre-order one of the systems with a Xeon E3-1275 or a Core i7-7700. Um, you know, they're a little pricey. I want to say uh, the Sebastian did the write-up on this one. I want to say that the, this particular machine that they were highlighting is starting in the neighborhood of, I think the guess was about $2,500, but nobody yeah. really, 2500 is kind of the guesstimates depending on how much they want for the secret sauce that is the air-cooled case. Um, but nobody's going to know until the Kickstarter project actually starts. Got it. So, I love the idea of it. I yeah. question if it's possible, I guess, to some degree. <laughs> Right, uh, but I would love to be proven wrong because it's also one of those things. When I, when I saw the picture when we were recording our podcast last night, I, I thought it was a photoshopped image there in front of the just in front of the monitor because I didn't realize how big the device was. I looked at the pictures of the back where you can see all the ports, and I was like, "Oh, okay, this is not a small case. It's actually pretty big, all things considered." Right, so it kind of looks pretty small there if you're not paying attention to the size of the USB ports. But as soon as you look at the the rear picture. You start to understand a little bit of the scale that that you're working mm -hmm. in, and go, okay, maybe it is possible that these guys could passively cool all of that hardware in that type of structure. Um, It'll so be interesting nice to I, see how it actually attaches to the CPU and the GPU. Um, like I have yeah. a feeling, like this, you know, maybe the CPU is on one side, the GPU is on another, uh, creating ventilation for each of the two things that generate the most heat on the device. Drayton Williams tweets, any plans to talk about the Ryzen 24G APU at Ryan Shroud at Patrick Norton? Benchmark leaks are looking promising, and it just so happens, ladies and gentlemen, that the AMD Ryzen 5 2400G and Ryzen 3 2200G review, a.k.a. the return of the APU, is up at PCPer.com. If I want desperately to build a gaming machine, and I cannot pony up the staggering cost over MSRP for... Uh, you know, a GTX 1070. Although I did actually see it at AMD uh, 560 for sale recently for a very short period of time, but it actually was for sale. It's the first time I've seen one for sale in months. Um, it sold out in minutes. But, I mean, can I do 3D gaming on one of these uh, Radeon Vega graphics-equipped Ryzen 3 or Ryzen 5 APUs? So, uh, yeah, right? So here's, here's the thing about these parts. <laughs> yeah, right? they, you know, uh, and they're still $169, $99 processors. So they're not going to you know, blow you out of the water in terms of either CPU or GPU performance. What they do have is they're two to three times faster than the Intel equivalent part in terms of integrated graphics performance, right? So the Core i5-8400, the Core i3-8100, they use Intel you know, Ultra HD Graphics 630. Um, it just cannot keep up with what the Ryzen 5 2400G and Ryzen 3 2200G can do and you can see there in the specs table you know the, the they both use vega integrated graphics the higher end uses 11 compute units the smaller one uses eight compute units but they're still significantly ahead of the graphics performance there and if you go to the second page where we look at the integrated graphics performance you'll see that it the 2400g is going to run slightly behind like uh, uh, a discrete solution like the nvidia gt 1030 Right, so in a couple of games, it's close to matching it. Uh, yeah, sorry, third page. Uh, in in a handful of games, it's still a little, it's still significantly or noticeably behind, I would say. But it's competitive. Mm -hmm. This is not a a high end gaming solution, but it is a excellent mainstream entry point. I don't know if I would ever tell somebody to build a system on this if they were, you know, if they were looking to buy a 1070 or something like that, but couldn't because of pricing and availability. I don't think you'll be happy with the solution this provides mm -hmm. because 
if you're looking to buy a 1070, you're probably not looking to play 1080, 1080p low or 720p medium quality right. settings, right? You're probably looking for something quite a bit better than that. However, if you are a, a, a general average consumer um, that is okay with that, or you're building a secondary system, or um, you want to have a PC and maybe just you want to play League of Legends, you want to play Overwatch, those types of things, this system will absolutely do it and significantly better than what the Intel platforms will do. And it does so at a significantly lower cost as well because if you think about... So the second thing I'll say about performance is on the CPU side, the Intel parts are are going to be faster most of the time. The Core i5-8400 is a six-core, six-thread part. And the Ryzen 5 2400G is a four-core, eight-thread part. And we already know that the Intel cores have higher IPC. They're better performance per core, per thread um, than the AMD parts. So the, 85, the 8400 from Intel is faster than the 2400G from AMD in CPU tasks, multi-threaded, for the most part, single threaded, definitely. Um, but the what the Ryzen APUs offer now is competitiveness in the CPU space that AMD couldn't offer at all before in an APU, like the seventh gen APU, the Bristol Ridge based stuff that was out before it. So that's a good thing. Um, the the interesting thing also is AMD hasn't been able to address a significant part of the market because think of how many. You know, mom and pop computers, small business machines, uh, you still just use the Intel integrated graphics because they're not gaming at all even. But it so it's just easy to use the integrated graphics on that part. You don't have to buy a discrete solution. Uh, AMD wasn't able to compete with that with its new, better CPU architecture because they didn't have a part that had integrated graphics on it until now. So now they can address that part. If you are a builder and you're like, okay, I want to build a 1080p low you know, 16 by nine medium setting box before your answer was going to be a core i3 processor. And then you'd have to buy a discrete solution, like a $75, $80 NVIDIA GT 1030. So you were going to pay $120 for the processor, 80 to hundred dollars for that GPU. AMD says, well, now you can get a 2400 G for 169 bucks or even a 2200 G for $99. And you have a significant cost reduction already. And couple that with the fact that there are tons of platforms available for the AMD systems in terms of low cost motherboards. Right. right. You've got all those options. You've got you don't have to use X470. Wait, yeah. You don't have to use an X series board. You can use as a B series board or even an A series board from these AMD partners. However, if you use a Core i5-8400 or Core i3-8100, they only have Z-series motherboards available that support Coffee Lake parts. So your motherboards are going to be more expensive as well. Um, so AMD has a lot of advantages there. It's right. just, I think it's a little different market than maybe how we had set it up as, right? Like this is not, I, I don't want to put this as a gaming first product, it's more of right. a product that can do gaming. It's, it's kind of AMD's big hurdle right now is they have a, a way right. better integrated graphics part on their processor. Now they have to figure out why people should use it, right? And we have this one example <laughs> of mainstream, you know, entry-level gaming. But what are those other use cases? Are there other applications sure. and workloads uses that will use the uh, improved graphics performance here uh, above what Intel can provide? We shall see. It's amazing how many motherboards are out now uh, for AMT, uh, like AM4. Yeah. It's just crazy, the number. Of, especially if you want like mini ITX and micro ATX um, or Pico ATX. It's just there are tons of options that are worth considering. We should take a moment to thank our sponsor, Rocket Mortgage by Quicket Loans. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage. People, mortgage experience is a nightmare. Just wasn't keeping up with the times. It was painful, dated. It was about them, not you. It needed a client focused technological revolution. You know, we got these things called computers now, right? That's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. Gives you the confidence you need when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing home loan. It's simple. You can fully understand all the details and be confident you're getting the right mortgage for you because there's so many options out there. It's nice to have a little help, it's convenient. You know, it's it's a, you know, we're talking about Quicken people, Quicken loans, Rocket Mortgage. They have trusted partners allow you to share your financial information with Rocket Mortgage at the touch of a button. It's powerful. It doesn't matter if it's your first home or your tenth home. 
Rocket Mortgage can perform thousands of calculations in seconds to let you know what you're getting into. Based on your income, your assets, your credit, Rocket Mortgage can analyze all of the home loan options for which you qualify and find the one that's just right for you. Doesn't that sound nice? Rocket Mortgage by Quicket Loans. Apply simply, understand fully, mortgage confidently. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash twitch. That's rocketmortgage.com slash T-W-I-C-H. Equal housing lender licensed in all 50 states. NMLSconsumeraccess.org number 3030. And we want to thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans for their support of This Week in Computer Hardware. Oh, man. The uh, uh, MSI is ready for the second-gen Ryzen APUs. I, do, do, do we have a ship date for those yet? Like, they've got the BIOS update. <laughs> They're pushing they, it out. So, like CES AMD said April. Um, now, what's interesting is that if you look at the, the APUs we just talked about, those are 2000 series parts as well, the 2400G and the 2200G. So they kind of fall into the same category. Now, they it's kind of a mix because the, the Ryzen 2000 series desktop CPUs, the ones that won't have integrated graphics, Right. that are part of the quote-unquote Zen Plus architecture uh, are going to be using a slightly revamped process technology, process technology from Global Foundries called 12 nanometer, although it's really a 14 nanometer plus improvement type thing, but it's all branding. We won't have to get into that. Um, so I think that the processor performance of the upcoming Ryzen 2000 series, think of, you know, what a 2800X, 1700, 1700X, all like I assume they're going to use the same model numbers and push forward. Um, you'll probably see somewhere of a 10 to 15% performance improvement, but you might see some power efficiency improvements, maybe some overclocking capability improvements uh, with these when they come out in April. I, I, what I want to prevent is people thinking that, hey, the jump we saw with Ryzen, where we saw this 50% improvement in IPC, that that's not going to happen again. And we want to make sure that people don't have this false uh, understanding of what AMD is going to be able to produce with this. Keep in mind, this is not even the, quote, Zen 2 architecture. This is just like Zen Plus. It's a little bit of a tweak, a little bit of a refresh. Um, and I think we'll see early next year the Zen 2 architecture come out um, on uh, from from AMD for for desktop processors. So uh, MSI has pushed out BIOS updates for this. Basically, you know, for, from AMD standpoint, they want partners to have these motherboards ready for the new processors when they come out. AMD did also announce at CES that there's going to be a new chipset based on uh, this. I guess that's the X470, right? Um, so, but you'll still be able to use all the existing boards. The new boards will have, I think, a little bit of like uh, clock improvements and maybe some power management improvements as well. But um, all these existing boards will be able to support it. So they want to make sure they have the board ecosystem ready, the platform ecosystem ready, because these are just slot in socket, you know, processors that are compatible with the existing parts out there. So I expect you'll see if they haven't already posted them, Asus and Gigabyte uh, and the other guys post similar BIOSes as well. Because they want to get these out into shipping boards. So when you go into Fry's or Micro Center or whatever, you're not buying a board uh, that can't be booted with the processor you also buy. An interesting side note there, I did oh, see awesome. today AMD awesome. posted a um, kind of like a, a support page for this. So this already has kind of happened, right? With those APUs. Those APUs are supported on existing motherboards. However, if you buy a motherboard from Newegg and you buy this processor from Newegg, but the board has been there for a while, it hasn't had the most recent BIOS updated, you get sent those, you put your processor in another board, you don't get a post, you can't update the BIOS, uh, what are you supposed to do? The uh, AMD is basically offering you a boot kit that you will send, you give them the serial number of your processor, they send you a boot kit. What's interesting is they have not detailed what the boot kit is yet. So there's two options. One, they're sending you a new BIOS chip for your board, although a lot of these boards don't have replaceable, user-replaceable BIOS chips anymore. Or two, they're, they're going to send you a Ryzen 1000 series processor that you can put in your motherboard, update your BIOS, and then send that processor back to them. That's going to be my, that's, that's what our guess here is what they're going to do, which is kind of um, crazy, but also like super admirable. <laughs> AMD would be willing 
to go to those lengths to do that, right? Maybe they've got some RMA parts or some 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 used parts that they can't sell, and so they've got a couple thousand of these that they can use for this back and forth um, RMA process for this particular unit. So, something to keep in mind and uh, uh, watch out for if you are buying into either of these new platforms. Good to know. Also, keep an eye. It was funny because I was I was looking at some of the AMD motherboard options on Newegg. And one of the things I remembered is is one, turn off the non-Newegg sellers. I'm sure all sellers on Newegg are great, but I prefer to order stuff on, on Newegg from Newegg. And then as I did that and started rattling through, it went from like 173 motherboards down to like 12. Um, <laughs> and it's it's amazing to realize, right, there's, there's micro ATX motherboards that cannot actually support uh, Ryzen parts that run more than 65 watts, for example. Um, mm -hmm. And it's also interesting to watch some of the availability on these drop down uh, at the moment. Uh, wow. It's also one last thought, amazing to watch. Uh, you know, uh, it seems like with certain categories of AMD motherboards, uh, a three or four star motherboard is a rarity and usually out of stock. Um, you know, I, there's. It's also it's it's crazy to realize there's so many options and there there are many cases where. Like the entire micro ITX category, like the highest number of reviews on a motherboard is like 16. Um, mm. So shopping for motherboards, always exciting and even more exciting than usual. Did you know the Twit Flash briefing is now available in Canada, Australia, the United Kingdom, and India? It's been in the U.S. for a while, so now is the perfect time to go into your Alexa app settings. Sorry. And under Flash briefing, look for Twits. If uh, you'd like to have all of the information, um, NZXT 8700i tempered glass ATX mid tower case review. Uh, you've probably heard me say this too many times over the last 473 million episodes of this week in computer hardware, but I'm not a huge fan of, uh, you know, glass portholes in the side of cases. But I will say this is uh, much more aesthetically pleasing than the typical. Uh, glass kind of sided case we've seen or maybe i just like that crazy you know I, I don't know what that is that that sort of substructure line thing that's scooching by the processor there and and down over the top of the motherboard um includes the cam powered smart device that digitally divides should be digitally drives rgb lighting and fan performance uh, adaptive noise reduction optimizes your builds acoustics through machine learning and ideal fan settings Four integrated Air F fans and two RGB LED to enhance the aesthetics of your build as seen through the 8700i's stunning tempered glass panel. I am uh, not quoting Sebastian. I am quoting Sebastian quoting the marketing uh, spiel for this. Uh, it's a good-looking case if you're into sort of monochromatic uh, experiences. Um, did, uh, did he enjoy uh, the overall experience yeah. in the software? Easy to build in, very clean design, good cable routing. Uh, the tempered glass is, is all the rage. The software, uh, they call it CAM, the CAM software, is, is a combination of system monitoring, uh, RGB fan and color controls. All that works really well. Um, it even has noise monitoring in it, uh, which, is, which is interesting. And I... And I I think I saw some place said that there was a microphone in there, but I don't know if that's the case. And it, I think it's more being an estimate uh, based on the fans and what speeds you're running at. Uh, like I said, full RGB control there. And then from performance standpoint, it does very well, right? A lot of these cases are kind of running together in terms of temperature performance and noise performance now. Or, um, but the H700i does, you know, it's the quietest under full load of uh, the cases here tested or near. Yeah, actually it is uh, at 48.1 dB. Um, and it does well in temps as well, kind of uh, uh, right, in the, right in the middle of the mix there against other ones like the Corsair Crystal 460X or the Fractal Design R6. Sebastian goes through a lot of cases. It did get a uh, gold <laughs> award. It is expensive though. It's 199 bucks, which is uh, definitely a premium price to go with what he calls a premium enclosure. He says from fit and finish to performance and features makes compelling option for the hyper in the hyper saturated market. Uh, if you can spend this much on an enclosure, it's an elite option, but a lower price tag can make it better. So I think we say that about most things, but uh, 200 bucks for a really high end case. And again, it's all about styling when it comes to that, as you, as you mentioned, I really, I dig the way that it, that it looks. So I think yeah. a lot of other people, it's will a pretty well. case. 
I, I also looked up on the NZXT's website. It has a built-in noise detection module, uh, which okay. sounds like a microphone-like object. <laughs> it does, the, doesn't it? Noise detection <laughs> module. Uh, and also, it's nice to see some some relatively clean aesthetics being applied to the software that manages fans and uh, hmm? and lighting inside of a PC. Because you know, there's a lot of a lot of excessive design. Uh, in yeah. the, I used to watch a lot of sci-fi movies, and now I get to design a UA. I also was, I thought it was interesting looking at the enclosure temps, how little difference there was um, when you were under a full GPU load. I mean, you know, you're looking at like five degrees difference um, Celsius, you know, from the the best performing to the worst performing uh, case. Um, and the noise levels, however, change a lot more. Um, you're looking at a, a difference of you know, five, six, seven, seven decibels. That's, uh, that's noticeable. That's uh, a lot. It's a lot of people. Your case matters. If you're the kind of person that thinks a case matters. <laughs> Cause I was, I was driving down one of the, one of the main streets in my town and somebody was, had left a bunch of stuff with a free sign on it. And, you know, it's really hard for me to not pick up any ATX case I see on the side of the road because you never know when you need a, a cheap case for a build, and nothing's cheaper than pick it up on the side of the road and got a free power supply. <laughs> Although now I, I have a, a, a nice stock of reliable, robo-approved power supplies, uh, you know, distributed in my system, so I don't have to use the horrors of a cheap 10-year-old ATX power supply from a case of dubious origins, um, which I have done in the past and suffered for. Um, I just want to say this out loud right now. I'm afraid of water-cooled uh, power supply units. Um, <laughs> Jeremy wrote this up. because Jeremy would write this up. Um, quote, if you run the FSP Hydro PTM plus modular PSU in boring mode, then it is limited to delivering a mere 1,200 watts of 80 plus platinum power. If you use it as it is intended, however, the addition of water cooling allows 1,400 watts of power to flow out of this PSU, and you won't even see the fan start to turn until you hit 50% load. So, if you order in time, the first 500 units come with sleeved cables as well as a Bits Power AIO kit, including pump radiator and a 120 millimeter fan. Uh, Check out the PR link below for more details on this very unique $700 product. <coughs> you know, and given that we're seeing like 1,000 watt PSUs with fantastic performance and 10 year warranties selling for uh, a fraction of that price, you know, well under $200 and much closer to $100, I will say, man, this is, this is over the top. And, uh, of course, it's got uh, RGB lighting too. <laughs> of course, come on, man. Of course, you're gonna water, you're gonna water if you're cool looking, power spray, put LEDs on it. If you're looking for the last little thing to just really make that uh, NZXT pop, this might be the way to do it. Your water cooled <laughs> power supply. I have difficulty. Well, you know, it would be hidden. I guess it would glow. The bottom, the power supply section of the Zen ZXT H700i would glow from the lighting on your water-cooled power supply. I just, I keep saying water-cooled power supply and laughing because it's just, it's a level of madness here. And I got to say, it's some amazing render up on their website. Yep. $700 of the limited edition first 500 units. <sighs> Crazy. Oh, oh my man. goodness. <laughs> Anything you can tease that's coming up at PC Per? Uh, Ken is actually putting up final touches of a memory scaling performance story with the rise of mm -hmm. APU. So looking at integrated graphics performance, how much better it gets as you add faster memory, and then uh, maybe some commentary on like, hey, memory is expensive. So what should you actually do if you buy one of these platforms? It's obviously going to vary for everybody depending on what your your budget is but i think the idea of buying a hundred or 150 dollar processor and then spending 180 to 240 dollars on system memory seems kind of nuts but you don't really well, have a whole choice right now with the way uh the markets go yeah <laughs> if nothing else you know there's you know, if 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 a if a entry level 16 gigs of ram is like 200 bucks right now and the expensive ram is you know, 
something significantly over that. If yeah. it gives you a performance gain, it's worth considering. But if it doesn't give you a performance gain, then it's something worth avoiding. Um, yep. Memory is not going to get cheap anytime soon. Everything we have talked to uh, insiders about indicates that uh, at best it will start to throttle back in price when yeah. Samsung brings its production online. But that's not going to be till later this year. And phones are just uh, – Android phones are just stuffing – more and more RAM on the phones as part of their sort of checkbox procedure for being competitive uh, against other manufacturers that are putting staggering amounts of RAM in their Android phones. Uh, we had some fun uh, this week, of course, with the, the Huawei review. Um, I reviewed Western Digital's uh, My uh, Passport Wireless SSD on Tech thing this week, which is their solid state drive update. Um, you know, it's crazy. It's USB 3.0 drive. It's a wireless hub to allow you to connect uh, computers to it, uh, to backup data, or to stream off of a built-in Twonky or Plex server. And best of all, it's got an SD card reader in the side so that when you're working or traveling, you can just stuff your, take your SD card out of your camera, stuff it into the side of that. It'll suck all of the files, all the new files or all of the files uh, off the SD card and store them locally so you can have a backup of your SD cards or then reformat your SD card and start over again. But it's fun. Uh, a little bit more expensive than the standard uh, uh, hard drive, but of course, uh, much less likely to die if you drop it, at least from one meter or below. Uh, so that's, uh, that's up on tech thing this week. And uh, I actually have a review of Contour's Unimouse, and we talked about some confusion about CPU wattage and, uh, and cheap Wi-Fi routers versus mesh Wi-Fi systems. Uh, specifically, as it applies to a uh, tech thing viewers uh, new three story condominium, <laughs> which I think is an environment where mesh Wi Fi might be a good idea. Not for the speed, though, for the coverage. My name is Patrick Norton. You can find me at techthing.com, avxcel.com, uh, which is a home theater and audio podcast. Uh, and of course, here at twit.tv slash twitch, Ryan Shrout is best found at pcper.com the hardware reviews website he has run since he was a child and they take names and kick ass in hardware reviews. And of course you can find him here at twit.tv slash Twitch. We do this show each and every week. We invite you to send your uh, viewer questions. Best way to do it is to tweet at Ryan Shroud or at Patrick Norton, uh, because that is where we kind of live on the Twitters. And uh, mm -hmm. we want to thank you for listening and uh, keep coming back with that. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Ryan Shroud. See you next week on Twitch.